believe it or not, is my rest day. Okay? <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor is having a rest. <laughs> so what we have with us today is a mighty man of God. Anointed by the Lord. Given a message so that all of you can be blessed out of your socks. So how many are ready to be blessed out of your socks? <laughs> May I call on none other than Pastor Jeffrey Andrews, okay? Hey, everyone. Yeah, I know. It's been forever. <laughs> All right, so today I'm going to be talking about um, breakthrough from breakage. So, um, so actually, God doesn't want you to shortchange yourself, but he wants you to go through the process of breakage, or essentially being broken, right? Um, and uh, let's take a look at what breakage is. It's um, the action of breaking something or the fact of being broken, right? So there's two things there. It's like we're either being, we're breaking something in our lives or we're remaining broken. Um, so we have things in our lives that are, are contrary to the word of God that need to be broken, right? And we all know that because I've had a lot of them that need to be broken. And I'm sure you guys have gone through that as well in your lives. It's, um, you can look at it like a branch that's growing in the wrong direction, right? And when that's, that's happening, the tree can't grow straight, right? It ends up leading to one side or another. So See, these things need to be trimmed, they need to be cut off. There's things in our lives that need to be just removed, cut off, broken, whatever it might be, right? Um, so, and, and that's the process that God's taking us through is on a daily basis, right? Regardless of how long we've been in Christ or, you know, if it's been years, months, or whatever it is, there's always this process that we go through, this breakage, um, just so that God can strip away, you know, all these things, um, you know, there, there are many times in my life that I had to be disciplined in, because my thinking was wrong. I was thinking this way, and God's word was over there. So God had to remove that stuff uh, from within me. Um, you know, it was painful. Every breakage is painful, right? Um, the, you know, at the time it was painful, but then it was beneficial for my spiritual growth. You know, whatever it was that I went through, um, I was just went from glory to glory to glory. You know, I've had to be dragged through the mud, so to speak, several times just because I needed it, right? Um, just because I was stubborn or hard-headed or whatever it was. Um, and we all go through that. So this is what, just reminding you that this is part of the process. This isn't a, oh, God's punishing me or he wants to strike me down or something like that. No, he's just disciplining you, okay? So if we want breakthrough in our lives, we're going to need or require retraining, meaning removing the old, right? Forgetting how to do the old ways that we did, training on the new ways, and then discipline to keep that. Amen? All right. So first, we need to, uh, we have to desire breakthrough. Um, we want breakthrough, but sometimes we're not willing to be broken, right? We want the victory but we don't want the process to that victory. And let's take a look at Psalm 57 or 5117. It says here, the sacrifice you desire is it a broken spirit. Yep, it is a sacrifice. And it's a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. And so when this psalm was written by David. It was actually when, after he was rebuked by the prophet Nathan for committing adultery with Bathsheba. Um, and, you know, and he's the king. He could have ordered Nathan the prophet killed, right? He, he controlled everything. He could have done whatever he wanted to. But instead of doing that, no, he repented. He broke down because there was still something in his life, even though God had already trained him. He had already gone through a lot of things, right? Because before he became king, um, he was... Saul was envious of him and was chasing him all over the country, trying to kill him. And yet he submitted to God, submitted to God. But then, even at, up, up to this point, there was still something in him that needed to be broken, right? That needed to be removed. <clears throat> and the prophet Nathan went and rebuked um, David for it. But 
because he had a repentant heart, because he was broke, he decided to remain broken before God. Um, he became an even big, better king after that. But uh, like he's saying here, you will not reject a broken and repentant heart. God will always receive you if you're just broken before him. You know, sometimes when we say breakthrough, what we're really telling ourselves is blessings, as in money. Um, but don't cheapen yourself with money. You're worth so much more than that, right? You know, I should know. I used to think this way, too. It's like, especially when I first became saved, it was like, oh, money, money. It was just, that was the breakthrough for me. It's like, yeah, if I just get that. But we need to get away from just thinking about these physical things, right? Um, you know, Jesus sees us so much more than just whatever physical things, right? In fact, he paid the ultimate price for us. Yeah, so take a look at, uh, let's take a look at Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46. He says here, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Now, that's not talking about you finding God. That's talking about God finding you, all right? That field is the world. He found the treasure, you. That's what he looks at you as, how he sees you. You're this chosen treasure. And he found you in that field, and what did he do? He went and sold everything he had and bought that field out of sheer joy. He was so, so happy to do it. You know that we do the communion as a reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus? I mean, it was rough, but that was a joy for him to do it. It's a, uh, it says somewhere else, is. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, um, scorning its shame, right? The joy set before him, which is us. We have to look at ourselves as a lot higher than, um, than the way we think of ourselves, right? As just a physical worth. It's way more than that, and it's definitely spiritual. Let's take a look at verse 45 here. It says, and again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls, when he found one of great value, again, that's you, the great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So when you're going through whatever serial trials, sufferings, etc., don't think God doesn't value you at all, right? That's, in fact, the exact opposite. What he's doing is training you, breaking you, removing these things, these dead branches that need to be removed right? Essentially, is removing the worthless things and keeping what's of value, right? Because we bring a lot of baggage with us in our Christian walk sometimes, even though we shouldn't, right? Just like uh, when you went to heaven, you, you went in there and God said you tried to get in and you couldn't and said, God said, you know what I don't like and you know what you need to do. And he started just taking things off. He was already in the spirit at that point, right? But it's just taking off this baggage, taking off this junk, all these things that were unnecessary. And that's what God's doing with us, right? Just stripping that away so you can be even more valuable, right? It's like, you know, look, you can think of it as like polishing a diamond or whatever, like just making it look shiner and shinier and brilliant, right? So that it can really shine. And that's what it is. Um, so... In fact, we should be rejoicing when we go through these things. And that's what the Apostle Paul learned. So our desire for breakthrough needs to move from merely the physical into the spiritual. And that's where the true breakthrough happens. We need to see past the immediate issue, past this whatever problem we're going through, um, and see the promotion in the spiritual realm. So let's take a look at some synonyms for breakthrough. Um, here it's advancement, development, and a step forward. See, so if your difficulty was resolved, you didn't necessarily step forward. You're still in the same spot, right? But if you learned out how to handle your difficulties, boom, step forward. Whatever was back there, not a problem anymore. You know how to handle it. Next problem, boom, step forward. We just keep advancing, keep them. That's this breakthrough that God wants us to have. 
right? The breakthrough in the spirit. It's like we we learn how to deal with whatever our issues are. We learn how to drop them and keep moving forward. So let's take a look at something else. As God breaks us, um, it's not because he can, but so that we realize our dependence is on him. Amen. Right? He doesn't get, he doesn't enjoy breaking us. It's like a parent disciplining their child. Is it fun? I mean, unless you're sadistic, but yeah. <laughs> There are people like that, but you know, um, it's it's not fun. I never enjoyed disciplining my our our daughter, you know, and you never did either. But it's like it's something that had to be done because there are things that had to be broken, wrong thoughts, attitudes, whatever it was, right? Rebellion that had to be removed. All right, so let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter eight. This is verses one to six. And this is when God was leading the Israelites um, into the promised land. It says, you must keep carefully all these commandments I am giving you today so that you may live, increase in number, and go in and occupy the land that the Lord promised to your ancestors. It says, remember the whole way by which he has brought you these 40 years through the wilderness so that he might be, so that he might, by humbling you, test you to see if you have it within you to keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you by making you hungry and then feeding you with unfamiliar manna. He did this to teach you that humankind cannot live by bread alone, but also by everything that comes from the Lord's mouth. Let's take a look at more stuff here. It says, your clothing did not wear out, nor did your feet swell all these 40 years. Be keenly aware that just as a parent disciplines his child, that's what I was just talking about, so the Lord your God disciplines you. So you must keep his commandments, live according to his standards, and revere him. So you can see that God breaks us by humbling and disciplining us, right? But what else is there? He just doesn't abandon you, right? <clears throat> Even through the discipline, there's provision, right? He made them hungry, but then he fed them with manna. It's like, what is this unfamiliar thing? You know, um, it's like something new, something. It's like God wants us to be flexible, to be able to change. It's like, it's like okay, but there was food there. There was provision there. Yeah, what is it? That's what manna means. Yeah, <laughs> it was like, but sometimes God will take you through things. It's like you, you'll go through his trial. And the, the solution will be something you never experienced before. And you just have to trust them that that's the right thing. Right? It's like, because we have things in our head and saying, okay, this is how God's going to solve my problem. But that's not how he does it. Right? He does it the way he does it. And again, for, they were out in the desert for 40 years. But their clothes, their sandals, everything, it didn't wear out. 40 years wearing the same outfits. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't have to, you know, get new ones or anything like that. Their sandals stayed perfectly fine. They didn't wear out. I mean, walking for 40 years on the same sandals, <laughs> you'd think they'd run out, right? But uh, God's provision was there, right? So, so even whatever it is we're going through, God will provide, right? He's not going like, to completely abandon you and let you figure things out on your own. He's always there teaching you, guiding you, leading you, and directing you, right? And that's the whole point of it, so that you start relying, instead of on yourself, you start relying on God and looking at him as a source. And then once you figure this out, that's when the breakthrough comes, amen? amen. So let's take a look at the next verses, uh, 7 to 10. It says, For the Lord your God is bringing you to a good land, a land of brooks, springs, and fountains flowing forth in valleys and hills. A land of wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, and pomegranates, of olive trees and honey. A land where you may eat food in plenty and find no lack of anything. A land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you can mine copper. 
You will eat your fill and then praise the Lord your God because of the good land he has given you. Amen. But before they got there, they had 40 years. <laughs> Who wants to wait 40 years for their breakthrough? No. <laughs> no. But see, that it's because they were stubborn, right? The Israelites were just completely, constantly resisting God over and over and over again. That's why it took so long. Because really, the trip from Egypt to, to the promised land, what, you can do it two, three years. I mean, with everybody, because they had tents and all these things like that that they had to drag along. But they could have done it quickly, right? Because there was a time, actually, after a three-year period, God said, okay, go take up the land. And then they sent the spies in. You guys know that story, right? And the spy says, no, we can't do it. Um, yeah, there are giants in the land. Yeah, yes, it's really my land flowing with milk and honey and fruit and all these things, but we can't do it. Uh, the giants are too big. They'll destroy us. And they convinced the entire clan, all of the Israelites, oh, we can't go in. Yeah, and then God said, okay, fine, you're not going in. You're going to have to wait another however many years, right, before you can go in. And then what did they do? The same people that convinced the people not to go up said, no, we're going to go in and take the land. It's like, how hard-headed can you be, right? Uh, and then God said, fine, go ahead, but you'll be destroyed. And, of course, they tried to. They were destroyed. And then, but now another four years. So don't be like that where you're constantly fighting against God, right? Because you, you can get that discipline, and you can be like that child who's just taking it. And it's like, I'm, you know, I'm going to do this again. I don't care. You can beat me as hard as you want to. Don't beat your kids. <laughs> yeah, just discipline them. But, uh, yeah, we don't want to be that way. We want to be like when God's, because if, if you're flexible, you're not going to break, right? God says, okay, this way. It's like, yep, yeah, yeah, whatever it might be. Um, don't resist God. Don't resist his discipline. All right, so with that said, it's be willing to be broken. If you want more from God, then expect to give up more to God, Right? See, the Israelites got a portion of the blessing that God had in store for them, but they were kind of forced into the breaking process. But God wants us to be the ones breaking ourselves, right? Removing and stripping away these things. Be willing to go through whatever that is. There's Because he still needs to teach us how to get to the point where, oh, we need to get rid of these things, right? But then when we get to that point, we're the ones that are like, okay, God, strip these things away from me. Please remove whatever it is. Um, that you don't want from me. So we need to go from children being disciplined by their parents to an adult disciplining themselves. Amen? Amen. So let's take a look at sec, uh, Samuel 24, 24. Second Samuel. Yeah. Uh, and this was one another time David sinned. Um, it says, but the king said to Arona, um, this is the, the, there's a plot of land that God wanted David to build a temple on. Um, and then it happened to be owned by this guy. So King David is, is telling him, because uh, Arona was giving it to him for free. It's like, yes, just take it. Um, God wants you to build it here. Just, uh, you can have it. But the king said, no, I insist on buying it from you. I will not offer to the Lord my God bird sacrifices that cost me nothing. See, David's attitude was not, God, give me. It's like, God, what can I give you? I mean, God's so generous. He's just going to pour stuff on you. But our attitudes need to change there, right? It's not, I mean, I know when I first got saved, it was like, okay, Lord, what can you do for me? It's like, I'm a Christian. Now. It's like, I thought I was doing the right thing. But in the back of my mind, it was always, what can you do for me? What can you give me? Um, how can you bless me, right? But we need to change that. We need to go from that to, Lord, here I am. You know, send me. What can I offer you? What can I give you? You gave me Jesus. That's way more than anything I can offer you, right? So I might as well give you everything else in return. Amen? See, we aspire to receive more from God, yet we're unaware that there's a price to be paid. And that price is the giving up of your flesh. Or the Apostle Paul say, in my flesh lies no good thing. 
And that's why we need to give it up. And we need to, like I said earlier, focus on the spirit, right? Where that breakthrough is in the spiritual realm. Um, yeah, we, let me just read this first. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 to 8. And this is the Apostle Paul talking about all the sufferings he's been through, right? He says, I'm, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. I mean, this is actually himself that, that got caught up to the third heaven, but he couldn't even, it was just too much for him. He couldn't even say it was him, Right? And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. It's like God gave him this amazing revelations, but he couldn't even, it, um, because it was too much for people to handle, and only he's the one that could receive it, right? So I will boast a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, about my weaknesses, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. See, Paul was struggling with all these hardships. Um, you know, earlier he's talking about persecutions, shipwrecks, beatings, all these things he endured. He endured all, all these different things for God. Um, and he was getting tired of it, right? I mean, who would enjoy that? Seriously, if you're shipwrecked twice, wherever you go, you preach the gospel, you're persecuted, he was stoned to death. That, means, that doesn't mean he OD'd, okay? That means they threw stones at him until he died. And that's how the Jews killed people back then. Capital punishment. <laughs> um, but he received that multiple times. And it's like, after a while, it's like, ah, this is too much, Lord. But, you know, until he finally learned to, the secret is to rejoice in all circumstances. Amen. Yeah, let's look at the, the following verses. Verses 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Hallelujah. Who can actually say that here, right? I mean, it's tough, but yet his focus was on the right thing. Yes. He wasn't focused on what's happening to me, right, but what God's doing in me. Yes. And that's how, he could, that's how he was able to, to make it through all these things, right, just to rejoice in all circumstances. You know, he was, and he received secrets that people weren't even allowed to know yet. And we need to change our focus to that because... Like I said earlier, the change from the break, our thoughts of breakthrough need to change from physical into the spiritual, right? Because far more important than what you can receive here, he received like a deep spiritual revelation, right? Even Daniel received deep revelations. And we need to value those more than the things that we get. Because that's what God values more, right? Because once we're done here, we're dead, what are you going to do with those things? Yeah, you may have a really nice car or whatever. It's all gone, right? Whatever you do for the kingdom of God, that's what's going to last for eternity. Amen. And, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, we need to stop looking at just the immediate because we don't know what's going to happen in eternity. God hasn't really shown us everything yet, right? He's keeping, again, another secret um, that he's keeping. But it's just more, more like a surprise and trying to hide something from you, right? It's something that... Um, that he wants to, like a surprise gift, right? It's always nice to get a surprise gift. It's like, here, and then you really wanted it. And it's like, yeah. So that's, and those are the secrets that God has, right? It's not like, oh, I'm trying to hide something from you because I don't want you to know. Yeah, no sneaking around. Um, God doesn't like that, actually. You know, there's also like the things like the transfiguration, right? Um, 
was it Peter, James, and John were the only ones that saw it, and they couldn't even tell anybody until after the resurrection. So there's certain things that, that God has in store for us, like the seven thunders in the book of Revelation. Even now, we don't know what those are, but John knew it. How come he got, you know, he got that special revelation from God? And there's also the, those ministers that you saw that are candidates for hell. And then in the right time, God will reveal it uh, to all of us. And, and those are the things we need to be desiring because the word is what's, like I said uh, earlier, or we read earlier, uh, we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, right? That's what brings us life. Amen? Amen. So revelation from God will make us so full of his glory that we can be like Moses and Jesus who fasted for 40 days. They were all maintained by his glory, right? Imagine trying to do that on your own. It's like, I don't want that. I just want my good stuff. But, um, you know, at the end of the fasting, they weren't frail. They weren't weak. And in fact, they were even more empowered by the Spirit, right? They weren't somebody, okay, somebody take me to the table so I can eat. When Moses came down from, from the mountain, it was like he had the Ten Commandments on the, on the tablets, right? And he brought it to the people. He walked down on his own. He wasn't carried down by Joshua. And then he even rebuked the people. But, the, you know, because of that, the glory of God, he was empowered and he could do whatever. And there's also, I mentioned Daniel's revelation as well, right? So um, there's so much God has in store for us. If only we were willing to be broken to the point that we're, we get rid of our flesh and just focus on the spirit. Amen? Amen. All right. So uh, breakthrough in adversity. So having the word within us is what gives us the breakthrough. You know, worshiping God is important, um, but far, far more important than that is having the word within us. You know, God commands us to worship him, praise him, give him the glory because he deserves it. But it's the word that gives us life. It's, the, it's what makes us like him and changes us into him. Um, we have the example of Jesus, right? When he was hurt here, his focus was purely on the word. Uh, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. And we actually, this is Jesus quoting Deuteronomy that we read earlier. It says, but he answered, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that's when he was, after the 40, years, uh, 40 days of fasting and Satan was tempting him to eat something, just turned his stones into bread, and that was Jesus' answer. He was already hungry, but that was his answer. It's like, I'd rather have the word than food. Yeah. You know, it's easy to sing songs of praise and worship when we have music in a live band, you know? It's, it all sounds really good, right? It's like, yeah, praise God. Um, but it's another thing when you're doing it through adversity. You know, when Paul and Silas were jailed for their faith, um, they weren't shaken. They were actually able to worship when they were in chains. They were praying and, and worshiping God. And let's take a look at that. It's in Acts 16. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. It's like, yeah, they had their own congregation there in the prison. And they were doing God's work when they got in prison, right? They weren't <laughs> messing around. Um, they casted out a demon from this, um, some, some girl that was, did demonic prophecies, but, um, and then they got arrested for it. So they were actually doing the, the will of God here. Um, and then suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. It says, the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. <laughs> then, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. See, because of their faithfulness, they were able to receive their breakthrough. And what was the breakthrough? It's in the next verses, 29 to 34. It says, the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Hallelujah. This is far more important than anything else we can receive is bringing salvation to everyone. Amen? Amen. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. 
Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and his whole household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Amen. See, because of God's faith or because of their faithfulness, their willingness to be broken, it's like they could have complained, God, I was doing your will. Why am I in prison? Why would you do this to me? It's like, did I do something wrong? Nah, they weren't moved by that. They just continued praying and praising God. Amen. He learned, like he said, he learned to rejoice in all these circumstances. It's like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to heaven anyway. They can do whatever they want to me. It's like, and that was his attitude, right? And that's the same attitude that we should have, right? It's like, yeah, the world can do whatever they want to me. I already have Jesus. I'm set for life, for eternity. Amen. All right, so I'm going to end up with, uh, end with this last section here. It's be resolute. So we need to be pers- purposeful, determined, and unwavering. And that's what resolute means. That's Psalm 51, um, verse 10. It says, create for me a pure heart, O God, renew a resolute spirit within me. And again, that means purposeful, determined, and unwavering. You know what unwavering means, right? You know, go changing your mind, purposeful as you have one exact thing that you want done. And determined means nobody's going to stop you. Amen? And that's what God wants to renew within us, a resolute spirit. You know, when God moved me from, um, from Apple to Intel, I was, actually, I was actually quite comfortable at Apple. <laughs> but, but then I felt a stirring within, inside, inside of me again to, to, to move. And I also wanted to be uh, home as well uh, with Pastor Natalie, right, instead of constantly going to the bay back and forth. But God made a way during that time because right now there's a downturn, right? You hear all these tech companies laying off people, like lots of people. But then right before that, they were a hiring spree. And that's when God brought me in. It's like time to move over. And then once that happened, <laughs> they did the downturn. And then there was actually years ago, um, Pastor Natalie saw a vision of me at Intel. There's like a tornado in Intel. And I was at... I had a parachute on, but I was going up. And it, I don't know, this is what God does, right? It's like things that don't make sense, but hey, this is how he does it. But I was going up instead of going down in the parachute. And then she was trying to look up, and, and she see it, and she couldn't see. I just kept going up and up and up. It was like, well, the first time was until, like, that didn't really happen. It, it wasn't anything major, right? But now I come back, and it's like, yeah, the tornado is just a whole... Uh, the whole tech industry is kind of in a mess right now. And I go in and I'm even actually promoted to a higher position, right? So praise God. Um, I was, of course, I was comfortable at Apple, but God said to move. So I move, right? Whatever it is. Um, in fact, they were even, again, Apple was going to give big raises to, to all their people. You know, when I was leaving, my, my manager was saying, are you sure you want to go? Because you're about to get a big raise, just like because the whole company is. But, uh, you know, God said to move it, but he blessed me here anyway. Amen. Amen. Um, of course, I didn't just jump ship. I received the word, right? Whenever you go, and that's why I said earlier, the focus is on the word. Um, whatever, even through this whole breaking process, the word is what's going to sustain us, is what's going to keep us going. And I did receive a word there, so I didn't just jump and say, I'm out of here. Because um, I already got used to going around all over the place. But, um, and while, we're, while I was there, um, there's, of course, this whole thing of uh, oh, who's going to get let go and who's not. And uh, again, another word to receive or a vision Pastor Natalie saw. So like a hump, like a bump, like I just got skipped o- or mound. Yeah, it was, it was coming down and I just got skipped over. Um, as far as the the letting go goes. And then, yeah. And then she saw a vision of a pizza. and <laughs> Or just a slice, actually. Um, and that slice was kind of dark. Um, and, you know, there's 
there, yeah, it looked like something bad was going to happen to that one slice. But why the pizza is like, she didn't know that, in fact, I didn't even know that there was like eight people in our team. Because um, we're kind of all over the place and we're all remo working from home anyway. So that's why and God showed her the pizza. But, um, and I was like, okay, who's that dark person and whatever? Uh, not dark person, but who's person that's in darkness, right? Then I later learned that like the, some of the big bosses wanted to get rid of somebody from our team. Um, and that's what she saw, right? And essentially, it's just for me to probably just to pray for that person. Um, but, you know, but God will always give a word. He'll give provision, like I mentioned earlier, right? Whatever you're going through, even if you're hungry, he'll provide food. Uh, your sandals won't wear out, whatever it may be, right? As you go through these, this branching or this pruning phase, a trimming phase, a breaking of things that, that, uh, don't, that God doesn't want in you, there's going to be provision. It's not going to be, you're just in agony, right? Um, he will provide a way out um, just to comfort you. Whatever it is you need, you'll get it until you get to the point there where, okay, yeah, I don't need those things. I realize, yeah, I can strip those things away from me. Who cares? I have no use for them. All right, so I'm going to leave you with this. Um, it's be willing to be broken so that you can step into your breakthrough. Amen? Amen. All right, so uh, Pastor Natalie, I guess. Thank you, Jesus. Um, can we have this removed, please? Thank you, Jesus. There's something God would like us all to understand, and that is um, before he does an explosion in your life, which is external, what he would like to happen is for you to have an implosion of his word inside of you. It takes time. But God is patient. But God is determined. But God is going to do it. As simple as that. Now, how many are aware that when you're going through something really hard and tough, it's like being in, in a furnace. And while... Pastor Jeffrey was explaining something. I saw us being in the furnace. And I said, I thought we were already gold. God said, but in order for you to become a 24 carat, he said, you need to go through fire. And I need to remove all the dross that makes it less than 24 carat. And God will separate those unnecessary things in our lives. Each one of us is God's chosen. Each one of us, look at your neighbor and say, God wants you to be a hero. Because the hero of heroes is within you. And God showed me how a lot of these people, especially the young people, I'm warning you. If you think you can treat God nonchalantly and cheaply, you can think again. Because that's how the world would like to treat God. But mature people, people who are in for promotion, they focus on what God wants to do. What God is going to do for all of us in this church is take us to the next level. A lot of people look at me and they want the goods that's in me. And people do that to you and to me. They like you. But here's my question. Are they willing to pay the price of becoming like you? Hmm? Look at your neighbor right now and say, are you willing to pay the price? <laughs> Our sister said something earlier on. That she had to take on the gift of celibacy. 
Sis, I know what you're talking about. I know exactly that. When God removed my family from me, do you think it was easy? I remember looking at God and I said, I don't have 20 families. I only have one. What is it that I haven't given you yet? And so I said, because I couldn't understand what he was doing. Please understand, when, you, when God qualifies you, you are a top gun. And your training is going to be tough. When God is saying you're a top gun, stop looking at yourself. He's just showing me something. He said, people are insisting, Bobby, that they will be low-class birds. When in fact, I have ordained them to become eagles. The one thing I will always remember about eagles, they, they ride over. They are, they're staying on top of the storms all the time. And the storms catapult them to the level called 35,000 feet. The air right there is not comfortable. It's super thin, the oxygen. And yet, they do it. And it is for you. And it is for me. And you're called to be one. Here's my advice to you. Cut your drama. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor right now. Mm, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Look at them right now and said, will you cut your drama, please? No more dramas, okay? I love the example that uh, Brother Jeffrey, you know, he didn't give you the full explanation that was there. St. Silas and Paul at that time, they were inside the dungeon of prison where there were rats, cock well, not my favorite thing, cockroaches, feces, and everything. And on top of that, their backs were open wounds because they were beaten up. They were bleeding, baby. And the Lord was showing me and he said, what happened, Bobby, there? They realized they were eagles. They rode on top of the storm. They had proven they were eagles because they soared. They did not go... <laughs> Stop flapping your wings when God made you or turned you into eagle. Let the storms push you higher. Okay. Cut your drama. Because it doesn't pay. Okay. It pays off. You cut it off. And that's all God is saying. Cut your flesh. Now, I'm not saying you don't feel anything. Of course you feel anything. It's just as you rise above your feelings. You tolerate that. Owie is owie. How many of owies here? Like, owie. I mean, really, really ouch, okay? You feel the pain. Are you joking me? I know the pain, but I remember when I was in, my, in, I was in tears. And I surrendered my owie to God. I said, I offer up this hour to you. And I want to praise you instead. And man, did I fly like an eagle. I soared like an eagle. Enjoy it. James, the apostle of wisdom, spoke about this to encourage you and I. He said, count it all joy. When you are having an avalanche of trials and tests in your life, every test becomes a testimony. And remember the saying, every mess becomes a message. 
that's for you and that's for me. Only cut the drama. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you are always finding yourself in such a drama? Look at your neighbor and say, yeah, baby. Yeah. I like it the African way. Because like. they really mean it, okay? Sister, I was about to ask you to come up here and demonstrate. But all I'm saying to you guys is today, there are many things God would like for us. Pastor Jeffrey mentioned that when I entered heaven, I, I, I remember Jesus beaming with smiles said to me at the entrance, come in. Oh, he was so happy to see me. And I was the one that went. And I, and I remember him going. He tilted his head sideways and he said, you know what I don't like? And I said, yeah. And this is what he said. And you know what to do. I said, yeah. So great. Unnecessary weights in your life. In short, unnecessary dramas. Remove them. And when the last drama I remove, Jesus knew exactly what it was. And it was the perfect time. He looked at me and he said, come, we have a lot of things to do. Are, you all, are we all listening now, finally? Did God get our attention finally? I'm going to ask all of you to come forward and leave all your dramas at the altar. How many are willing to do that? <laughs> Pay the price, okay? Let's all stand up. Let's stand up. Let's bring you up here. We're going to minister to you for one simple reason. We want to agree with you that you don't need your dramas anymore. Yeah? Dramas of the flesh. I'm, I don't know why God kept saying to me, Bami, they're just dramas. And remind them, it's just a drama. New term. You will never see that in the Bible. Your drama. And yet God is using it right now. Let's all come forward. Come on. All of us. Because we have dramas. Okay? Thank you, Jesus. We're going to minister to you. Agree with you, okay? I'm, I'm not, hey, I'm not the answer. Jesus is the answer. But at least you need somebody to agree with you, yeah? How many are happy you're going to leave your drama here, okay? You're going to be delivered from your dramas, yeah? Finally, okay? No, no, guys, get crowd over. We are a family, come on. We smell each other and we enjoy each other's smell. Come on, come on, come on. Come forward, come on. Crowd over here. Because the anointing is here. Yes. And it is the anointing of God that breaks all the yokes, plural, of bondages in your life, okay? We're going to leave on one condition. You're going to leave your drama, okay? Leave all your shenanigans here. And take with you. You know, this is what God was saying to me. I love the way God said, deny yourself. Say it with me, deny myself. Deny myself. And to say, deny the drama, okay? Again, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Uh, we have more space here. Here, 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 here. Sis, sisters, come forward here. You can shadow them, okay? It doesn't matter. Come forward. Jesus needs you here in front, okay? I love it. Then Jesus said, deny yourself. Say it with me. I will deny myself. <laughs> now, before you, you, be you pick up your cross, you have to deny yourself first. Say goodbye to your flesh. Yeah? Uh, no, no. You can say, bye flesh. Bye flesh. And then you pick up the cross. The cross is the life God is giving you. It's not just, I came that you might have life, Jesus said. And the word that was used there is soe. It's not ordinary life. It's the God kind of life. Do you want Zoe or your ordinary life? Take your pick. But you have to deny the old life. Pick up the cross, okay? Okay, you're going to throw it away. He said, he said, deny. Pick up the cross, which is the new life in Christ. And then Jesus said, continue walking with me. 
simple procedure. Shall we say a prayer together? So raise the hands, everyone. Raise the hands. Father, as a, as a form of surrender, I'm, I'm not doing this, Lord, so that there will be ritual or there will be some, wow, gobbledygooks again in the spirit. None of these things, Lord God. We're doing this because we're serious. We really want to surrender everything, God. First of all, we don't know everything and anything. I, I, even St. Paul spoke of it, God. He said, the longer I am with God, the more I realize I don't know anything. That was St. Paul. Taking up to heaven and everything. Receive revelations and whatnot. And yet he said, the more I am with you, the more I realize I don't know anything. Father, by virtue of this, I am saying this right now from the bottom of my heart. That's our prayer. I'm sick and tired of my flesh. I'm sick and tired of all my dramas. It seems like every time, Father, I would like to make resolutions and be resolute. There I am again, fellowshipping with the flesh. But enough is enough. Say it with me. Enough in the name of Jesus of the flesh. And I, and I really mean enough. That's the end of it. Put an end to it. I sever myself from its control, from its power, from its influences in my life. And the future you want me to take. I sever myself so that you could help me, Lord. So you could use me, Lord, so that I can be the representative the most I. And now, Father... As I surrender everything. Say it again. I surrender. Say it again. I surrender Jesus. I surrender all. I'm willing to take on. The life that you said. Zoe. The God kind of life. Say it with me. From now on. I will entertain. I will enjoy. Regardless of anything or everything, the Zoe, the God kind of life, that's all I desire. And now after that, Lord, we just want to walk with you every day. It's not a once-off thing. It's not like on this Sunday only. It's every day. Say it every day. Every day. Again, every day. And to make it final every day, every day, we will have a loving walk together. We're going to have fun, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.